God is good. And all the time. Amen. I have had a number of opportunities to stand before you all and to speak with you and to share a little bit of um, what the Lord has been sharing with me. And this, uh, this past week um, was my birthday. And um, I thought, given I have the opportunity to uh, share with you guys this week, that I would um, give a little bit more of myself and tell you my story. To the extent that you guys might be impressed with the grace and mercy and love of God. Um, I have made a, a big deal oftentimes that it is a privilege for me to stand before you. I truly believe that it is a privilege for me to be standing here for Lord knows I should not be. And, um, and today, uh, hopefully you guys will see a little bit of, about what I mean. Um, let me say that. So, Made is the, is the name of um, my testimony because I believe that men are not born, they are made. And um, so before I begin, I want to have a word of prayer and just to uh, just ask the Lord to guide me as we, you know, get through some of the, the muck that is my life. <laughs> so bear with me. Father, we know that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Father, as I share today, I pray that you, your spirit, will guide my mind, my words, my thoughts. Help me to place the events in such a light, Lord, that you would be glorified and edified. That you would be glorified and we would be edified. May, uh, though I will be uh, speaking about myself, I pray that your goodness to broken, sinful man will shine through. Help me to communicate the lessons that you have taught me through this journey. And Father, I pray that uh, those who hear, um, they will receive a blessing. And they will hear only that which will uh, lead upward. Be with me now. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I have to set a timer so I don't get lost on the journey. Okay. All right. So, um, so starting off about me, um, you guys know me. I'm Ryan Wilson. Most of you know me. Uh, those who don't, my name is Ryan. Um, I was born to Gregory Wilson and Ronnie Wilson. That's my mother and father. My mother is actually um, staying with me uh, at, this, uh, at this time. Uh, my dad is a truck driver. He's been driving since before I was born. And uh, he actually was on the road when I was born. So, <laughs> um, and, um, so uh, this is my mother and father. I am actually a middle child. When this picture was taken, I was the youngest or the second youngest of five. There was one that had not yet been born, um, but um, or maybe she was born. She just wasn't, you know, old enough. But now I'm technically a middle child. My um, my mother has five. My dad has three biological. They share two. Right. Um, these two right here. Uh, um, that's my older sister. And uh, you guys know Grayson. That's his mother. Right. Um, so my mother and father, uh, soon after uh, I was born, probably about uh, when I was about two or three, they ended up getting divorced. And after they got divorced, I went to live with, let's see. Oh, no, there it is. I went to live, oh, I don't do too much. There it is. I went to live with this lady here. And this is my grandmother. Now, my grandmother was a Seventh-day Adventist. Amen. Right? And you know what they say in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6? 
Train up a child in the way he shall go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And we went to a church that I wasn't, I wasn't aware of at the time was a Caribbean church. And they said the affirmation of faith every Sabbath, right? They would, we would all stand and we would recite the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, right? And so this was, was constantly, you know, kind of like drilled in for, from the ages of three to eight. At the age of eight, my father remarried. Um, the reason why we weren't living with my father is because he's a truck driver, right? We couldn't really live with him. So when he remarried, he remarried a woman who was not an Adventist. She was Christian, however, but she wasn't Adventist. And, um, and so we went to live with them. And so basically around this time, you know, church became one of those things that kind of took a back seat. Um, you know, my dad, my dad is a, is a huge uh, media person, he loves music, loves movies playing video games, and that's how I was brought up, you know, in that, in that atmosphere, music, movies, video games. And so my childhood wasn't bad, you know, it was, it was pretty good. We were, we were sheltered, more or less. Um, having a father in my life, I think, did wonders, um, you know, to have that stern hand there. Even though that he was a truck driver and he was, you know, gone a lot of the time, you know, you always knew when daddy was coming home, right? You know, so, um, so you know, having him in my life was, was you know, very important. Um, I was a happy-go-lucky child, right? You know, just <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> this was a race, okay? We were racing, and apparently whoever I was racing, you know, they weren't a threat, okay? So, <laughs> so, so um, but I was, a, you know, I was a happy child, you know, spent a lot of my time in my own world. And, um, and this is kind of how life was. We, we went to church occasionally. Dad would make us walk down the street to go to church. He, he didn't go that often, but he would make us go. And uh, of course, when we went and visited Grandma, we would go to church. Um, this kind of continued on um, till about the age of 13. At the age of 13, my mother had moved back into uh, Ohio, or around that time she had moved back into Ohio. And she would come in, pick us up for visits every, uh, every once in a while, right? She would come in, uh, pick us up for visits. And this particular time, um, you know, my dad had told us, hey, your mom's going to come pick you guys up. But if your chores ain't done, y'all aren't going anywhere. And so, you know, it's like, okay, well, we're going to, you know, do our chores. And we, we you know, we, you, we, I mean, at least I thought we did our chores, but, you know, kids. And uh, they weren't done to his satisfaction so what ends up happening is when mom gets there he says i already told you guys if your chores aren't done you're not going anywhere so mom comes in to seek to reason with dad and and to you know and to, to it's not that big of a deal let them go blah 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 well she's at the bottom of the steps he's in his room upstairs and and so she's yelling up the steps and he's yelling back down the steps and this goes on for some time and um you know three four five minutes into it they're in a full-on shouting match and um now dad is coming down the stairs yelling telling her to get out of his house and um and 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 this is escalating quickly well, she's still trying to talk to him and backing up because he's walking toward her and he's belligerent now and he pushes her. Now, it wasn't a, you know, a shove. It was, it was more like a, it was a push, like, hey, get out of my house, but a push nonetheless. She bumps into the table and my older brother being there gets between them and says, hey, don't put your hands on my mom. Now, you guys saw my dad's not a small guy and my brother, he's not a big guy. <laughs> And, um, and they start to fight, and my father pins my brother against the refrigerator. When this happens, my mother's uh, maternal instincts kick in, and she runs over to the kitchen, grabs a knife. She comes back, and she stabs my dad three times in his back. My dad did not die. Uh, my dad is still alive, praise God. Um, and, and, but this you know, kind of created a shift in my mind. And a lot of times when I'm telling my, my testimony, you know, I'm telling these stories, but really the stories are just 
the, the events are just the catalyst to the way that I think, how the Lord is working on my mind. So when this happened, a shift happens, and, you know, I start to, I start to um, go into these depressions. And, and, you know, one of the things that kind of broke in my mind is how could two people who were married and, you know, loved each other degrade into such a state where they can't even be in the same room and, and, and you know, this is the result. So after this happened, um, my dad, my mom was, you know, taken to jail. My dad uh, was taken to the hospital and we go stay with my mother's mother for a short time. And then we go stay with my dad's cousin, uh, who we called our aunt uh, for the next year uh, where, um, where, you know, just, we just went to school and did what we did while the whole court process went on between mom and dad. Um, at the... At the end of uh, this year, my dad brings us and he says, who do you guys want to be with? You want to be with your mom or you want to be with your dad? Well, we've lived with our dad this entire time. And, you know, so naturally we say, well, we want to be with mom. We don't, you know, really get a chance to see mom or spend time with mom. So we go and live with mom at the age or at I was 14. My sister was 16. And... Um, I, I call this part of my life the road to atheism. Um, at this point, <clears throat> without dad there, you know, uh, my I have an older brother, and um, he was, I mean, very much what you would expect from a young man who hasn't had a father in his life and, you know, is getting raised by the streets, you know? Um, he sold drugs. He you know, participated in different things that he probably shouldn't have participated in. And he was my big brother. I love my big brother. I want to be just like my big brother, you know. Not to say I wanted to sell drugs and things like that, but I wanted to be around my big brother. I wanted to spend time with him. So I started hanging out with him. And uh, during that time, I was exposed to many a different things. I was exposed to, you know, drinking, smoking, partying, you know, and the nine. And I'm 14, 15, you know, at this time. Um, and so at this point, that becomes my life. I, I like to party. I like to play video games. And, and I'm not necessarily atheist. It's not, you know, something that's necessarily, you know, on my mind. I'm not really thinking about God. We've, we've kind of stopped going to church at this time. And, um, and everything just became, you know, just regular everyday life, right? There was no, there was no idea of God. So um, I had a lot of, you know, memorable moments, you know, at this time. Now, the idea of God did come to my mind when I met my best friend here. His name is Jamal, um, and Jamal uh, is an atheist. Uh, he's still very much my best friend, and he's still an atheist. And, um, and he had kind of like brought this up to me, and, you know, he was just kind of like, nah, I don't believe in God. I'm, you know, I'm not going to say anything about it because his 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 parents were you know very strictly like godly people but i think his problem was similar to my problem with god while my dad would tell us to go to church he would stay home and watch tv and play video games you know so it's it's sort of like this this you know like okay you say that there's a god but yet you you do this and and it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. There's an inconsistency in Christianity. So anyway, you know, this is some random pictures of just <laughs> that jacket. Um, just some, some random pictures, you know, of, of you know, me um, when I was younger. So what ends up happening is about the age of 16 now, I moved to, uh, we moved to Texas. But during this whole time, after we moved in with my mom, she ended up getting sick. She had fibromyalgia during that time. And, um, and back when this was when, you know, people didn't really know about fibromyalgia. So a lot of people just called her crazy and said that, you know, it was all in her head and things like that. Um, and, and honestly, I didn't, I didn't care about like anything that, you know, she was going through or like I didn't, I had no thought of my mother's well-being whatsoever. I was very much self-involved. I only knew about what was going on with me. 
And I remember this one time, uh, me and my mom, we really got into it. And um, she, 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 couldn't, she couldn't discipline me. Like, I wouldn't allow her to. Um, one time she, she tried, and I, and I grabbed the belt, and I took the belt from her. And, um, and, as, as, uh, and as, as these things, you know, you know, spiraled down, I mean, I was cussing her out, you know, calling her all kind of inappropriate terms. Um, and, and it's so funny because I would listen to, you know, listen to my dad and, you know, he would say, I was crazy, but I was never that crazy. You know, and it just, it just, it just showed me how the degradation from one generation to the next always it, it happens always and consistently. Every generation will say about the next generation, I was never that bad. I would have never done anything like that. <laughs> so, anyway, we, uh, we, my mom, who's having a hard time finding work because of her ailment and, you know, and other different things, not only that, she's a felon, um, you know, some real crooked stuff happened with the court uh, with the court and she, she got, she really got raked over the coals. And, um, and so she moved, we ended up moving to Texas, uh, to get some help from my aunt. And so my aunt at this time, she was a, she was a, a pastor of a Pentecostal church. Now my mom's side has always been Pentecostal. Um, and, and while my grandmother who was seven day Adventist was the one who raised us and I view her as a very godly woman, I view my grandmother on my mother's side equally without a shadow of a doubt I can tell you that woman loves Jesus and and I and I praise the Lord and I'm pretty sure the only reason I'm here is because of those women's prayers so so we moved there to um, we moved to Texas Abilene Texas where we lived for a year and at this time I'm 16 turn getting ready to turn 17 and I'm like hey you know it's time for me to get a job I want a job and, you know, because I'm now in this church atmosphere, everybody's telling me, well, pray for it. You know, the Lord will provide. And I say, well, okay, well, it couldn't hurt, right? So I pray, and two weeks later, I get my first job at Olive Garden. I was like, oh, okay, praise the Lord. Okay, maybe God does Israel, you know, maybe he does answer your prayers, you know? And at this time, I start to, uh, I start to attend church more. You know, I'm attending a Pentecostal church, but I'm attending church nonetheless. And um, one service, after seeing what seemed like the entire church speaking in tongues, um, I was like, man, this looks like power. I've never seen any power like this growing up in the Seventh-day Adventist church. You know, it's just boring. You know, I, honestly, I used to always sleep in church. Oh, like, that's what I did. I always slept in church. I would go in, and I would, yeah, I love the song service. As soon as the guy started preaching, yeah, well, <laughs> you know, wake me up after you know, um, but this, this had to be power, you know. So after the service, I go up to my aunt and I say, Auntie, I want this power. I want to speak in tongues. And she says, okay, baby, well, come on. We're going to get, we're going to get the elders. We're going to go into the conference room and we're going to pray until you're baptized with the Holy Spirit and you speak in tongues. I was like, all right, you know, that's what we do. So we go in there and we're praying and we're praying and we're praying and we're praying and, we're praying and it's like 10 minutes. Now, if you don't pray often, 10 minutes is a long time to be praying, okay? <laughs> so, so after, you know, 10 minutes, I'm like, ooh, okay. <laughs> All right, auntie, I don't, I don't think this is working. I, I don't think it's going to work. So, well, have you spoken tongues yet, baby? No? She will just keep praying. All right, pray and praying, and I'm praying for like another five minutes, and then the thought comes, I don't think they're going to let me out of here. <laughs> so I'll fake it. Say, oh, And they go, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Well, and that was the end of my Christian experience. Because in my mind, if I can fake it, and you all believe me, who apparently have the Holy Spirit, now, looking back on this now, I can say, well, Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit, and God wasn't having that. He let Peter know. So, I came up with this conclusion. I said, if I could fake it, as far as I'm concerned, you're all faking it. Now, granted, now I don't necessarily believe that. I do believe there is a spirit. I just don't believe it's the Holy Spirit. So, 
this part of my life went to the the reckless atheist. Psalms 14, 1 tells us the fool says in his heart that there is no God. They've done abominable things. And 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 there's none that do with good. And this verse describes my life to a T. When you throw off the shackles of God, and I call them shackles lightly, understand? The restraint, you plunge into this, this state of depravity. And, and the weird thing is, we don't even realize how depraved it is. I'll tell you. And, and, and this may not seem that bad to some, but, but just hear me out. I would literally lie to people just for the sake of lying to people. Like just, to, just because I know I could get, get away with it. You, and you just don't, you don't think, and, and not only that, you, there was a, and I call it a reckless atheist because there was no regard for life. At this point, I started doing just what I love to do. Drink, smoke, partying. Um, after that happened, after that incident happened, you know, and I kind of said that there was no God, I, I really set my mind to just doing what I want to do. I hated school. I hated school. So I dropped out. Dropped out in 10th grade. And I started working. Why? Because mer working afforded me money. Had to get that money. And once I got the money, I spent the money on the things that I loved. Video games. Alcohol. And drinking and driving was something that I did regularly. And when I say regularly, I mean just about every day. So, I'm not going to spend too much time in this part of my life. It's, it's... You know, the funny thing is, the only picture that was taken while I was atheist is this one. <laughs> this picture and this picture was actually uh, during the time of my first conversion. Um, which, pretty much, this reckless atheistic phase stayed about, I'd say, from about 17 to 22. Okay? 17 to 22. So I want to pull out, I want to look at this verse though, really quickly. This Ezekiel verse. And, and this was, I, I want to say, probably my biggest problem. Because during this time while I'm, while I'm partying and, and, you know, things like that, I, I, I you know how, you know, how um, you know, homosexuals, they come out, you know, they come out. Well, when you're in a, when you're in a Christian household and you're going against the grain of, you know, believing, right? You're coming out. You're coming out to your family and saying, you know what, hey, I don't believe what you believe. So I had an, I had an experience where I was uh, out partying and I was with a family member and I tell my family member that I don't believe in God. And you know what they tell me? They tell me I'm going to hell. And for me, for me, that didn't make sense because we're both doing the same thing. We're both at the same party. We're both drinking. We're, but now I'm going to hell and you're not. What is the difference here? So this text, in, in fact, this actually inspired, when I read this text, this text, it inspired a sermon <laughs> that I preached called Justified by Fakes. <laughs> and Isaiah chapter 16, or I'm sorry, Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 52, it says, Thou also, which has judged thy sister, bear thine own shame for thy sins that thou hast committed, more abominable than they. They are more righteous than thou, yea, be thou confounded also, and bear thy shame, in that thou hast justified thy sister. Now, God is saying this, in fact, uh, yeah. 
God is saying this in regard to Sodom and Gomorrah. Or he's talking to Israel in, in regards to Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's saying, you know what? You are justifying them because what you're doing is worse than what they're doing. Because why? Because you know better. You have the truth. Or you say you have the truth. And yet you still do the same things that they're doing. In my mind, there should be a difference between a Christian and an atheist. And I'm saying this as an atheist. So I say, okay, I, I just want nothing to do with y'all because you guys are deluded. You guys, there's something, there's something wrong. And then two, why, why would you want to party, right? You say, oh, I'm going to go out and party and then feel bad about it later. And you keep doing that. I, that didn't make sense to me. I, was, I would rather just not feel bad about it. You know, I put God away from me. So, so. Okay, all right. Now I need my notes so I can so I can know where I'm going. Ah, okay. So getting getting to um, my conversion, right? So this happens, you know, about the age of <laughs> goodness. I, I, let me tell you how stupid sin makes you. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> So I, I, was, I was working at Bose Grill once we moved back to um, uh, Ohio. And I got, I got my second job at Bose Grill, which was another restaurant. Uh, and, and, a, and, a, and a gentleman, you know, my, my boss, took a, a great interest in me. Um, and I, I, honestly, I'm, I'm not even sure to this day, but he's still a really good friend of mine. And he, like, he even helped me to get my GED, right? And so, so you know, he's the reason why I was able to keep that job. I worked there for about two years, but I was chronically late. Like just chronically, I, I was never on time. And, and what ends up happening is, you know, while he's out on vacation, you know, they tell me, hey, if you're late again, we're going to have to let you go. And the reason I was chronically late is because I was partying every night. Just every night. I, literally, I would party, and then I would wake up the next, the next day, and I would go into work, and because I worked in a in a restaurant, when I would go and I would go and clean the bar, I would actually steal alcohol from the bar to help me with my hangover, you know. So I would go through work essentially, you know, drunk, and 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 so this is like this is the the constant, you know, state of affairs and that I that I found myself in. So one day when I am, um, I'm like, well, hey, I don't want to lose my job. I come home that night. And uh, one of my coworkers are there. We called him Big Ben. He was about six three six. I don't know six six three six four. And um, and he was drunk. And there was two other people I didn't know. And they and they they give me his keys and say don't let him leave. And and they say we're gonna go get your roommate. So they leave. And Ben looks at me and he says, Well, I'm gonna give you two choices. You're either gonna drink with me or you're gonna fight me. And I say, hey, that's an easy choice because he's 6'3 and I'm, I've always been this height, you know? So, so I drink with him and then the next thing I remember is waking up at 10 uh, a.m. I was supposed to be at work at six. So, so here's my, my ingenious plan. And it, I call up my best friend and I say, hey, I need you to do me a favor. He says, yeah, sure, man, what is it? I'll let you know when I get there. And I go and pick him up, you know, and I, and I, and I grab all my, you know, half empty bottles of alcohol. I'm, and mind you, I am 18-ish at this point. And, 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 I, and, I go and, and I go and grab all my half drink bottles of alcohol, and I go and pick him up, and we go out to the middle of nowhere, and I start drinking, and I tell him, I need you to beat me up. Yeah, this is my plan. I, I'm, I'm late for work. I need a real good excuse. So, so he does, and you know I have a swollen jaw and busted lip and nose when I go into work, and I tell him, "Yeah, I was walking this girl home last night, and these guys came out and jumped me, and you know I woke up this night. I said, oh my goodness, do you need a do you, do you need a uh, you want us to call an ambulance?" 
No, I've been jumped before. It's not a big deal. So they say, okay, well, just wait here. And they leave and then they come back and say, well, we're still going to have to let you go. <laughs> just. The mind, apart from God, foolishness. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's not a dig at atheists and say, oh, you're foolish. For no, that is actually telling you the end, right? That is, that is where you're going to lead yourself by saying that there is no God. Foolishness. Okay, so after that happens, I end up moving to Arizona. My first time moving to Arizona, age 19. My dad's argument for Arizona was, it does not snow here. And I was sold. <laughs> and I come out to Arizona. And, um, you know, and, and while all this time, it's just much of the same, much of the same, right? And, and I'll show you how God has been gracious to me during this time, right? As I have said, I, drinking and driving was something that I did practically every day. I have been pulled over one time while under the influence, but it was not for being, uh, it was not for, you know, drunk driving. It's because I, I, I went around the cop instead of like pulling over and he said, hey, you need to pull over to the side. I'm like, okay. You know, you know, okay. And and had I had I gotten a DUI, I probably wouldn't have been able to get my CDL, which I now hold. You know. God God had been caring for me, just graciously caring for me while I'm spitting in his face. So oh Lord. Okay. Okay, <laughs> so so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna get to. Okay, so my philosophy, my my philosophy. While all this stuff is happening, I have a philosophy. You know, after um, I became an atheist, and the philosophy is that if there is no God, then the only reason for living is self gratification. Right, that's the only reason for living. Do what makes me happy, what I find enjoyable. And, and as I continue to live like this uh, from the age of 17 to about 22, um, I started realizing that, you know, those, uh, uh, those things that made me happy, they weren't lasting. It only lasted as long as the night did. And when I would wake up in the next, the next morning, I would, I would just really, you know, want to be drunk or high again like I didn't want to be sober I didn't like myself sober I didn't like I didn't like life sober and um, and it's weird because I would like saying like saying this to you guys now I'm like man was I an alcoholic I, but I don't think I, I don't like I, don't, I maybe I lied to myself and say I wasn't an alcoholic I was I definitely abused alcohol though um, and so so what ends up happening is I, I get a, uh, I, I went for a while. Oh, goodness, I got into this car accident um, working at Hertz Rent a Car. I worked at Hertz Rent a Car, where basically all I did was drove you know cars around the, uh, the the valley in Phoenix. And you guys know Phoenix is a grid, right? Right. That's going to be important later. But I would I would drive cars to different Hertz local editions, and um, I got into this accident and I T-boned uh, this this truck. And the truck, when, I, when it first happened, I was upset because the guy that was in the truck was a guy who didn't have a license and he didn't have any insurance. And I was like, why was he even on the road? And, and then the, the Lord said to me later on, he says, well, it could have been a mother and her child. I said, well, thank God it was that guy who had no business being on the road. And, and so I end up losing my job here and my dad ends up kicking me out because once this happened, I was attending uh, college online, and um, so I end up, you know, I dropped out of college. So I'm a high school and a college dropout, um, and and uh, I, you know, I, I lost my job because of that accident, and I, I was just kind of like back to doing, you know, whatever. And my dad kicks me out. He says, "Hey, you you got to be doing something if you're going to be in my house. You either got to be in school, you got to be working, you got to be doing something. If not, you got to go." So he kicks me out and I go to live with my sister and um, her uh, boyfriend at the time, but she wasn't in, in town. So it was just me and him and we were just 
partying. And, you know, I, I couldn't find a job. So what I resorted to doing was donating plasma. Anybody here ever donate plasma? Yeah? Okay, yeah. Yeah, those, those needles are not small. <laughs> you know, um, but that's what I did in order to supply my, my vice, my addictions. And so once my sister gets back, we can't live together. She ends up kicking me out, and I end up living with these people who lived underneath her, who I literally just met. And, um, and, and just the... I could, I, honestly, I could go on and on and on, but I'm trying to get to the, the, convert, the conversion uh, portion of this. So, so one time I'm living with these people, things didn't work out, uh, things didn't end up uh, working out there, and I ended up going to live with my... Um, and this is complicated, my sister's boyfriend's niece's father. <laughs> so, 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 and the only reason I mention him is because, you know, when I was there, I would always note that, like, this man was always dressed up, looking nice, and he always had his Bible, and he was going out, and I assumed that he was going to church, you know, and I, I lived there for a while before I got a job, and then I got a job at, um, at um, a neighborhood Walmart in Mesa, and and um, once I got a job, I started, you know, giving them some money because now I'm working. I just want to say thank you for allowing me to stay here. You know, I'm, I'm living out of a duffel bag just wherever I go. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, um, and that's happening for a while. And then all of a sudden we're getting evicted. I say, how is it that now when I'm giving money, you can't keep up with the rent, you know? Well, turns out uh, my brother had a, a gambling problem. You know, and um, and that, you know, as an atheist, strengthened me in my atheism. You know, so I go and live with a coworker, and uh, because of, um, well, because of unscrupulous behavior, that doesn't work out. So I go and live with another coworker. Okay, now, this coworker, his name was Daniel. Daniel, um, he was a uh, <laughs> he was a pothead, right? Like that, and we, that we had a we had a routine. We we worked at over we worked overnight, so we would work from 10 to 7 a.m. After we got off work, we would come home, we would smoke, we would um, uh, we would cook some food, watch a show while we eat, smoke again, go to sleep, wake up, rinse, wash, repeat. Right? That was that was the routine, right? That's just like every day, right? And as this, as this happened, you know, that's when I became more and more depressed. You know, I, I, I just turned 21, you know, about this, about this time, and I realized that I was working to, to smoke. Like, like that's literally, I was, I was working, I was getting my paycheck, and after I paid the bills that I got to pay, pretty much everything else went to smoking and drinking. And, and I said, but this stuff doesn't last, like... Like, if I could get this for free, that would be another thing, but I gotta go to work. Like, I gotta, I gotta put in effort to get this. So, it became, it became tedious. It became, like, just, you know, ridiculous. Now, when I threw off, you know, when I threw off Christ and I, in, in, the, in the heart of my partying phase, um, I, I did decide that I'm not gonna be 30 years old in the club. I'm not gonna do that. Like, I, I just, I couldn't see myself doing it. I had worked with people um, you know, and I was just kind of like, like, really, if this is the end of life, then I don't want to have anything to do with it. So I had made a decision that when I turned 30, I was going to commit suicide. That was going to be my, that was, that was going to be it. And, you know, I was making plans to go out in a blaze of glory. Um, now, I was like 17 at the time, and it seemed farther away. Now I'm 33. Praise God. <laughs> And um, so, but around this time at 21, I start to, I start to get more and more depressed and I, and I, and I start to think if there's no reason for God and the only reason for living is self gratification, but the things that you think will gratify don't actually, then there's really no reason for living. Why wait till 30? Why not do it now? So, so, so the thought came, well, okay. You could either, you can do that now, but understand you are thinking things differently. So you, you could do that, or you could give this God thing another look, right? Just take another look at it. 
So I'll say, okay, you know what? I'll do that. So, you know, I'm starting to search and, I, and, I'm, and I'm channel surfing and I come across TBN um, and, and I'm listening to the story and the guy's talking about the prodigal son, you know, and, and what he thought kind of the prodigal son's mentality was and um, how he just wanted to, you know, he just wanted to live and have fun, you know, and, and, and I could relate to that, you know, I just wanted to have fun. And, um, and, and he ended off talking about, you know, how God's, you know, God's arms are open, welcoming, ready to, ready for us to return. And, you know, I just kind of took it as, okay, well, that's nice. You know, I'm sure I've heard that before. And so as the, as the days go past, there's, there's a, there's a particular day now. And, um, you know, my, I'm, my, my roommate is out and he's out looking for, um, well, smoke, right? And as he's out looking for it, you know, I'm at home and I'm, uh, this time I turn to TBN just to see what they're saying. And the guy is talking about how God has a purpose for our lives, you know, and, and I'm listening to it and I'm listening to it. And I'm like, okay, yeah, um, God, has a, God has a purpose for our lives. Well, I, I couldn't see what he could do with my life. I'm a high school, college dropout. I got really nothing going on. Um, and, and, you know, but that sounds good. If he does have a purpose for my life, I would like to know it. And, and then he, he started, he went into this bit about asking, you shall receive. And, you know, and, and at the end of that, you know, they did the, the sinner's prayer and I, and I joined with them in the sinner's prayer. Now, I don't call this my conversion. I call this my, maybe my accepting that there is an idea that there might be a God. And, um, and so I was like, okay, well, we'll, we'll see. Well, after that, you know, after that had happened, my roommate called me and says, hey, look, I can't find any, so we're just going to have to go without. I said, all right, man, well, it is what it is. And then I say, well, I mean, a preacher man did say, ask and you shall receive. <laughs> so I pray and I say, you know, Lord, uh, I like to smoke. <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, right after that, my roommate calls me back and says, hey, just got off the phone with, uh, with my guy. He, j he says he's got some. We just got to come pick it up. So I'm going to come and get you, and we're going to go get it. I was like, oh, okay, all right. So he picks me up, and we go and get it. Once we're there, or, you know, we get it, and we're, headed, we're trying to leave, and the car won't start. The car won't start. So we're there for 15 minutes trying to figure out what's going on with this car. And, you know, while, while I'm ready to give up hope, the thought comes to my mind, work for the weed. <laughs> okay, Lord, thanks for the weed. I would like to be able to go home and smoke it now. <laughs> I don't know, man, just try it again. Mm, starts right up. I go, oh, there must be something behind this. So we get back home and you know and 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 we're smoking and i'm telling him my testimony as it were uh, you know up to this point and he goes yeah i know man you know god's done stuff like that in my life too i'm i'm christian too <laughs> you're christian i've been atheist this whole time and we've been living in harmony i didn't say that of course <laughs> <laughs> but I was just, I was just, I was telling him this and, and I said, you know, and I said, the only, the only thing, the only prayer that he has not answered yet was what purpose he has for me. And he goes, I don't know, man, but because of your personality, you seem like you should be on a radio or something or like have influence of some sort. And when he said that, I had like this eureka moment. Like my entire life flashed before my eyes. And, and it was as if God was saying, you know, although you rejected me and ignored me, I have been preparing you for what I have for you. Follow me. And, you know, when that happened, I started to you know, hyperventilate. And, and, and I was like, and he was like, mm, you all right? And I was like, yeah, I just, I just need to get some air. And, and, and I stood up, you know, because, you know, we just had bed on the floor. Um, I thought that was regular life. <laughs> but, 
but but we just have beds on the floor so i you know i get up off the bed and i'm and i'm and i'm and i'm trying to like catch my breath but i can't and i and i go to walk you know to go to the balcony and my legs fall from underneath me and and i'm on my knees for the next five minutes and all i can say is he is real and i'm sorry god started working in my life at this time and 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 he started impressing me with the wickedness that is man, that, that is us. And, and I didn't want to, I, I made a decision. I said, I'm not going to go to any pastor. I'm not going to go to, you know, a church or, or a Christian. I'm going to get it straight from the horse's mouth. So I started reading the Bible. And, and I started going through and I was, my favorite books were the book of Ecclesiastes and the book of Proverbs. And, and I started reading those books and I started reading the Gospels. And I came across this text in the Gospel, which you guys have probably heard me mention before, this text that I came in on. And I came across this text in Matthew verse five, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 48. It is still one of my favorite texts. And not just text, but one of my favorite promises. And Jesus... Jesus gives this command, and I read this, and it blew my mind. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, he says, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And that blew my mind, because my entire life I was told it's impossible to be perfect, so why try? It's impossible to be perfect. And now you have Jesus himself telling you to be perfect. Now, for me, it, it was such an encouragement because throughout this whole atheistic lifestyle, I had a, an idea of who I thought I was. But as life would show me, I didn't even know myself. Given the proper opportunity, that standard that I held would go by the wayside. And I got to a point where I couldn't even look at myself in the mirror. I didn't like what I saw. And now... Jesus is telling me that I can be something more than what I am? That was encouraging, brothers and sisters. And immediately God began to work. I started calling my family and, and, and apologizing for just being a terrible person. You know, I called my mother and, and called her and, and talked to her in tears, you know, apologizing. And, 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 and God, and when I called my dad and, and was talking to him, he said, oh, man, this is actually great timing because, you know, your grandmother's getting old. My, my Aunt Charlie, her, my grandmother's sister, had died, and she was in Ohio by herself. And he said, I want to bring her out here. And since I'm on the road, I'd like you to come and, you know, stay with her. And uh, so the lady who raised me, Seventh-day Adventist, when I was, you know, my first conversion, as it were, when I was converted, God brought her back into my life. And, and, and now this year, unfortunately, you know, I still wasn't ready because the old man wasn't willing to die, you know, overnight. Um, and I spent a lot of time, you know, going back and forth. I, I lived in Tolson now, Tolson now, and I was going back and forth from Tolson to Mesa because I was infatuated with a girl named Angel. The irony. <laughs> she was anything but every time I spent time with Angel you know I was just doing the same things you know drinking smoking I even started doing this synthetic cocaine had a similar effect but it wasn't the real thing and um, you know they say you know how she says in the desire of ages talking about um, the degradation that was before Jesus came she said, sin became a science. A science. And I think about that, like, man, what does it mean for sin to be a science? I'll tell you this experience, and now looking back at it, I, I, I realized that this synthetic cocaine prevented me from getting high and drunk if I did it first. So the next time I said, you know what? I'm going to get drunk first, then I'm going to get high, and then I'll do the synthetic cocaine. It's a science. You're figuring out how to, and, and 
sin had became a science. So, so this is what I'm doing. And one day, you know, I, I drop her off and, and I'm driving, you know, my dad's car. And after I drop her off, I'm headed home. And on the way, I black out. And when I come to, I don't know where I am. I, I literally would drive Phoenix like constantly and I don't know where I am. So I say, okay, well that's weird. This street looks familiar. So I go to turn right and in the midst of me turning right, I black out again. When I come to this time, you know, I'm a little shaken up because I'm like, well, if this is gonna keep happening, then I probably should like pull over and just kind of sleep this off. But then I see a street and I say, you know what though? I think, I think, I think this is the right street. So I say, okay, look, I'm gonna turn left here. So I'm gonna turn left. In the midst of me turning left, I black out again. This time when I come to, I'm pulling up into my driveway. And to this day, I still can't tell you how I got there, but by the grace of God. Amen. When I go into the house, because of the synthetic cocaine, I have a, a tweak, right? Um, so I keep rubbing the inside of my lip against my teeth. And I can't help it. Like, I just got to keep doing it. And, and my dad looks at me, and he is upset. And he's, he, he's cussing me out. And, and brothers and sisters, I don't remember anything that he said, except for this one thing. He said, you're supposed to be Christian. And that sank. Because I saw in myself that I was doing the exact same thing I was judging others for doing. I said, you know what? You're right. I'm supposed to be Christian. After I slept it off, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give myself wholly to God now. You know, and I, and I start to read my Bible and, and start to watch all the Jesus movies I can get my hands on. And you know, I was listening to the Bible and I was consumed. And um, one day... About a couple of weeks later, uh, I get, a, I get a, a message from Angel on Facebook, and she says, I miss you. She says, oh, no, sweetheart, I can't drive out there. It's just too far. You know, my dad doesn't want me using his car and all this and this. And she goes, I'm in Avondale now and sends me the address from 45, 50 minutes to 10, 11 minutes. It's practically around the corner. I said, oh. Lord, I, I feel like I feel like you don't want me to go. I but I but I want to go, but I, I feel like I shouldn't go. And Lord, I just need you know I need you to say something to me. And normally, when I would you know have a tough decision, I would flip a coin. If it was heads, I would go. If it was tails, well, who's gonna listen to a coin anyway, right? Like, so 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 this time though, I wanted to do something different. And I said, okay, Lord, I'm gonna pray. And I, and I get on my knees and I pray and I said, Lord, I just need you to tell me something sit on my bed and I'm sitting on my bed and my, my ceiling fan is going and I open my Bible and I open it up to, I think it was like Psalms 119, the 119th division. And, and after I read, have you guys ever done this? Right, you read and you're trying to make it conform to your situation. You're know, like, well, maybe it means this, you know? But while I'm sitting there trying to make it conform to my situation, the ceiling fan blows my pages over. And the first thought that comes to my head is, man, I lost my page. <laughs> and, and so I go to turn back, but then the thought comes, well, wait, what if God is answering you in the way that he wants to answer you and not your way? I said, okay, well, let's see what it opened up to at least. I lost my Bible at my grandmother's memorial, but the Bible that I had, the first, you know, you know how the Bible has the four sections, right? The first section started at Proverbs chapter five. And I... I said, okay, well, I'm gonna, let's just see what it says. It says, my son, attend unto my wisdom and bow thine ear to my understanding that thou mayest regard discretion and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. 
when I when I first opened it, I read the whole chapter. I I, I do like to ask at this point, what do you guys think I did? <laughs> that did not just happen. <laughs> I closed the Bible, I got the keys, and I left. I know, right? I love that response. <laughs> I got on the way out, because we lived in a development, on the way out, yeah, I get to this stop sign, and I realize, oh man, I left my wallet. I'm not going back to get it. I just said no to the Bible. I can't do that twice. Should be fine. I've been pulled over for years, you know? I go to put my foot on the gas, and I hear just as clearly as you talking to, uh, as you hear me, if you go out tonight, the cops will be involved. Put my foot back on the brake. Is that a problem? Ah, during my partying years, when I was about 20, 19, 20, I found myself on Mill Avenue in Tempe, and uh, that's the college party town, and I got a ticket for underage consumption and urinating in public. Um, that ticket, I'm 22 at this point, that ticket had now transformed into a warrant for my arrest. So, so, I say, well, I haven't been pulled over in this long, and I'll be fine. So I go pick her up, and, and <clears throat> can't go into her place because her living situation is, I mean, unless you ponder the path of life, her ways are movable. You can't know them. So, I pick her up and I say, you know what, we're not just going to stay driving around. That's that's increasing the risk factor. We're going to pull over, right? So we pull over and we're just hanging out side of the street. And we're talking for about 30 minutes. And then this SUV pulls up next to me and he like slows down. And then he pulls off real fast. And I'm like, what's that? Then about 30 seconds after that, I see these lights pop on in my rear view. And out of this alley comes a police cruiser pulls up right behind me and puts his lights on. Why did I park there? This story is the reason why I don't believe in coincidence. Wrong place, wrong time. The cop comes up and he asks me for my, you know, he's, what are you guys doing? You know, do you guys have any drugs on you? The no. You know, he, apparently he thought me and that SUV were gonna do some sort of drug transaction and um, the SUV saw him. And I don't, I, I had nothing to do with this. So he asked for our information, he asked for my name, asked for her name, she gives him a fake name. He, he comes back um, and, and says, well, Tempe wants you, man. Takes me out, puts me in cuffs. And I'm sitting there in cuffs and, and you know, all these things start to add up. My dad, I'm about to lose my job because I'm not going to be at work tomorrow and they were already laying people off. My dad's car is about to be impounded, you're going to have to pay to get that out of impound, gonna have to pay to get me out of jail, gonna, uh, um, he's gonna have to pay somebody to pick him up, and, and you know, all these things, I'm just like, oh, man, and then the thought comes, whose fault is this? Once that thought hits me, I just start laughing and smiling. I say, God is good. God is good. I'm standing there in cuffs. God is good. This girl looks at me like I got 650 heads, but she's like, what are you talking like? Because, because it occurred to me at that time that he had been trying to save me from myself this whole time. Oh. Well, the cop ends up letting me go and, uh, and, and, and uh, he says, well, get it taken care of. And, and I wish I could say, yeah, that was the last time I saw that girl. But there's another proverb. And it says, as a fool, oh no, as a dog returneth to his vomit, so doth the fool to his father. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here. <laughs> I'm going to stop here. And um, I, 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 this, this, this experience um, kind of was the catalyst 
that led me to um, that led me to to co missions actually. Mm. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who am I? Who am I? Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I, I went. I did canvassing. Anybody here canvass? Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Amen. Amen. More of us. We need a canvas. <laughs> it's 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 an experience. Um, you know. So we did canvassing. Um, made yeah. That's the color. Yeah, the cult missions, and uh, that's where I met my love. Yeah, and um, and um, and uh, God gave me a help me, and and honestly, there's just so much, you know, and 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 the lessons, the lessons that you know I've learned throughout this have been so sweet. They haven't been easy lessons. They haven't been easy lessons by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I want to leave off by saying this because I have children. And and I and I and I said this, you know, one time while giving my while giving my testimony, I said, "Do as I say and not as I do is the the faultiest form of parenting." I said that before I was a parent. <laughs> while I still believe, while I still believe it, I recognize how, how difficult it is. We want our children to have self-control. But how often we fail to control ourselves. You know, the next, the next after, after, after I, I leave from Tekoa, I, I end up having another conversion experience. Um, which I, I had intended to share with you guys, but um, I, spent too, I spent too much time on foolishness the foolish part of my life but I wanted to I wanted you guys to know that God is able God is able through all of through all of it through all of it he said he will contend with him who contends with us and he will save our children and and and, and having gone into those that now I wouldn't want any of our children to have to experience that. You know what? In, in, in Micah, he says you will eat, but you will not be satisfied. That is what the world offers. The world offers something that will have you constantly needing to go back for more and more to the point where you become solely dependent on it. But Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I fear for our children, for our children's children, because I thought it was bad in my generation. So much worse. I don't think I would be here if it weren't for the prayers of my grandmothers. Continue to pray for your children. God hears those prayers, and I'm a living testimony of it. Well, if God permits, maybe I'll share a, a part two to you guys at some other time. But uh, thank you for allowing me to share. And I, I, I pray that um, if not anything, you guys have hope. You know, if, if you have children who are outside of the church, you know, uh, continue to pray for them. God is able to, to do miraculous things. The, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God you know, chases me down, fights till I'm found. Leaves the 99. And I guess the next part of my testimony would be I couldn't earn it. <laughs> and I don't deserve it. So, so let's have a word of prayer. I don't want to hold you guys any longer. Oh.
Oh, Father. I pray that someone was able to take some encouragement. We are told that we have nothing to fear for the future, except as we forget the way the Lord has led us in his teachings in our past history. Father, as, as I've uh, contemplated and thought about the way that you have led me, even when I didn't believe in you, you didn't abandon me. You continue to seek after me. I am encouraged. And my faith is strengthened in you as a leader. I'm also encouraged for the fate of our children. Oh, Father, I pray that you will help us to do our part as parents. Forgive us where we fall short. Father, I ask that you will be with us as we, um, as we continue throughout this Sabbath day. I pray that um, we all will look back over our life history, that we might be encouraged that you have brought us this far, you can take us the rest of the way. Continue to be with us, continue to bless us. Strengthen and keep us, we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.